Good morning and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. My name is David Burton. I'm the Senior Fellow in Economic Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, today's discussion is the 12th in our speaker series, Free Markets, uh, the Ethical Economic Choice. You can watch previous events at uh, heritage.org forward slash free markets. And also they're available on the Heritage Foundation's YouTube channel. I would ask everyone to silence their cell phones. Uh, we are recording this, it's, going, it's webcast and then we'll be available on YouTube as I mentioned and we'd rather that we not have a cell phone, cell phone ringing in the middle of, of the presentation. After our speaker's presentation, we'll have time for audience questions. And uh, sometimes that is a, a very uh, fruitful part of, of these events. Uh, our speaker at the next scheduled event will be Paul Winfrey, who's the director of the Rowe Institute here at the Heritage Foundation. And his topic will be freedom and solidarity. You've got to have both. And that event will be Tuesday, March 5th. Our speaker today is Dr. Dr. Edward Fazer, and his topic is Socialism and the Family. This talk will be a little different from some of the previous presentations. People often don't think of the economic dimension of the family, except perhaps if you're a Chicago School economist working in the tradition of Gary Becker. But today's presentation will be quite different from that. And, uh, uh, I guess, along with private property, free markets, civil society, and limited government, the family is a central institution necessary for a free, prosperous, and flourishing society. Besides creating social bonds, it plays a central role in educating children, in character formation, and in mutual support. It is the central means of imparting what Hayek would call tacit knowledge, the knowledge necessary for both economic success and to a vibrant, responsible, and engaged Republican citizenry. Government can play a modest role in supporting family, but government can also play, and indeed has played, a serious role in damaging or destroying families. This has wide-reaching adverse consequences. Communists, socialists, and many progressives are typically hostile to family because the family, along with other institutions intermediating between individuals and the state, represents a strong alternative to state control of the economy and of the broader social order. Now, Dr. Fezzer is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Pasadena City College in Pasadena, California. He's been a visiting assistant professor at Loyola Marymount University in LA and a visiting scholar at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of California at Santa Barbara and an MA in religion from Claremont Graduate School and a BA in philosophy and religious studies at California State University. Dr. Fazer's primary academic research interests are metaphysics, natural theology, the philosophy of the mind, and moral and political philosophy. He's written a large number of articles for both professional journals and the broader media. He's also written 10 books. The most relevant to our general subject today are On Nozick, Locke, and The Cambridge Companion to Hayek. Dr. Fazer's work deserves, in my judgment, a much broader audience. He writes with a clarity that is highly unusual among academic philosophers, and he works within the natural law tradition, but is deeply informed about classical liberal thought. It's actually a joy to read his books, and it is always edifying. You can find out more about his work at edwardfazer.com, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Fazer. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. So my topic uh, today, and the, well, the title of my talk is Socialism versus the Family, and it occurred to me, perhaps I could have doubled my audience by giving it a title like Totalitarian Sex, or something like that, um, which would also, I guess, be somewhat relevant to what I'm going to have to say. 
Um, so let's get into it. In, um, in the wake of the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the liberalization of the Chinese economy, many observers judged at the beginning of the 21st century that socialism was dead. But if so, then like the zombies that have been all the rage in pop culture over the past few years, it is a corpse that walks. In the decade following the 2008 financial crisis, the rhetoric and politics of socialism, though mercifully not yet the actual practice of it, have seen a growing revival in the United States. During the same period, socialism has newly been put into practice in Venezuela with predict uh, predictably disastrous results. Now, the economic problems with socialism are well known and have been addressed by other speakers in this series. What I want to discuss today is the danger that socialism poses to something more fundamental than the economy, indeed to the very foundations of the entire social order, namely the institution of the family. Um, so let me begin by saying a bit about what socialism is. Uh, I think there's a handout maybe some of you have got hold of on the way in. Uh, and so if you're following along here, this would be, I guess, Roman numeral one on the handout. So let me begin by saying something about what socialism is, because the term is often used too loosely by friends and enemies of socialism alike. Socialism is characterized both by a certain kind of economic and political order and by an ethos or moral vision uh, that that order is meant to reflect. So let's consider these in turn. As an economic and uh, political system, socialism in the strictest sense essentially involves centralized governmental ownership and control of the basic means for the production and distribution of goods. Naturally then, a system is less socialist the more ownership and control of these basic means is dispersed between diverse private hands. It should be clear from this characterization that not all governmental intervention in the economy amounts to socialism because not all such intervention entails anything like centralized governmental ownership and control of the basic means in question. For example, for government to impose a certain tax or tariff uh, or to enact a certain regulation may or may not be a good idea, but taxes and regulations are not as such socialist. Everything depends on the nature of the specific tax or regulation. Some people indiscriminately attach the socialist label to taxes and regulations in general and then either reflexively condemn all taxes and regulations on the grounds that they are opposed to socialism, or they reflexively endorse socialism on the grounds that they are in favor of certain taxes and regulations. Such linguistic and conceptual sloppiness is regrettable and ought to be avoided. It adds heat to political debate while reducing light. Having said that, it is also true that a policy or an aspect of the economy can be socialist in substance, even if on paper it seems not to be. The key here is the notion of ownership. As philosophers who think about the nature of property often point out, to own something is essentially to possess a bundle of rights over the thing. For example, suppose I own a certain pencil. What that involves is my having the right to use the pencil whenever I want to, the right to lend it to others if I so desire, the right not to lend it to them if that's what I prefer, the right to chew on it if I feel anxious, the right to break it in half if I want to shorten it or simply as a way to take out my frustration, and so forth. To own the pencil is to have a bundle of such rights, and to have such a bundle of rights over the pencil is to own it. Now, suppose that on paper I was the sole owner of a certain piece of land, but suppose also that the government forbade me from using, building on, renting out, or selling the land without its permission, claimed the right to some or all of whatever income I made using the land, claim the right to build on or otherwise alter the land if I so desired, and so forth. Then we would have to say that in substance, the government was really the co-owner or even the sole true owner of the land since it claimed for itself most of the rights that ownership would normally entail. So while it's certainly true that taxation and regulation are not of themselves socialist in nature, it is also true that the taxing and regulating of a resource or enterprise can be, become so extensive that it amounts to de facto government ownership or partial ownership of the resource, and thus to a kind of de facto socialism, or at least partial socialism. For if government reserves to itself a sufficiently large number of rights over how a resource is to be used, or how an enterprise is to be conducted, then in practice, it functions as the owner of the resource or enterprise, even if on paper the ownership is in private hands. In that case, the economic inefficiencies and other problems that afflict officially socialist systems will to a large extent also afflict this more subtle kind of socialism. This is, of course, the concern that many people have about a single-payer healthcare system. 
I've said that socialism concerns government ownership and control over basic means for the production and distribution of goods. Socialism in the strict sense, anyway. Goods are more basic the more uh, other goods there are that presuppose them. Suppose the state claimed the sole rights to produce and distribute wooden toothpicks, but otherwise left the economy in private hands. This would hardly be a socialist system because there is very little that depends on getting access to wooden toothpicks. The economy could get on pretty well without them if need be. But if the state claimed the sole rights to determine the use of wood, whether used to make toothpicks or furniture or houses or whatever, then we would be much closer to a socialist system since wood is presupposed by the manufacture of so many other things. And of course, if the state claimed the right to determine the distribution and use of all raw materials, wood, stone, iron, glass, etc., then we would have a more or less fully socialist system since nothing at all can be made without them. Socialism can come in degrees, then. The more that specific taxation and regulation policies approximate the having of de facto ownership rights over various resources, and the more basic are the resources over which those rights are, held, uh, are had, the more socialist in substance a system will be. And again, this is the concern many people have, part of the concern many people have about the idea of single-payer health care insurance, and so much of the rest of human life depends on, um, on medical care. Now, all of that concerns the economic side of socialism. But as I said earlier, there is also an ethos or moral vision associated with socialism. Suppose the state had total control over the economy, but that the state was in turn essentially the personal property of some individual dictator who mobilized all of its resources for the sole end of benefiting him personally. Though the economics of such a system would be socialist, no socialist would regard the system as socialist in spirit. The reason is that socialism holds that the state ought to own and control the basic means of production and distribution for the sake of the collective, for society considered as a whole, rather than for the sake of any one individual or group within society. Now, this collectivist ethos can be interpreted in either of two basic ways, depending on the attitude that a socialist takes toward the broad liberal tradition that has dominated Western politics since the time of Hobbes and Locke with its commitment to the ideals of individual liberty and equality. One approach would be to reject this tradition altogether, and in particular to reject the idea that a just society has anything to do with treating all individuals as equals or with securing their liberty. Rather, on this first approach, justice has to do with securing the good of society considered as a nation or a race, a single collective organism over and above the sum of the individuals that make it up. According to this view, not all individuals are equally crucial to securing the good of the nation or the race, and respecting their liberty might be contrary to securing that good. Hence, individuals may be sacrificed for the sake of the nation or the race. This is national socialism, most notoriously associated with Nazi Germany. And for those of you who, who are following the Amazon series, uh, Man in the High Castle, where you know, you've got an uh, 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 imagined parallel universe where Nazi Germany and uh, Imperial Japan won World War II. You've got an illustration of this. You know, you've got one of the main characters there who, whose son, because he has a certain disease, is sacrificed for the sake of the good of the, of the collective order. Okay, so that would be very much in the spirit of, of uh, national socialism. Now, of course, most socialists would be horrified by this idea and see themselves as heirs to the liberal tradition of regarding respect for the liberty and equality of all individuals as the essence of a just society. It's just that they hold that a socialist economic order, rather than a capitalist one, is the only way to secure true liberty and equality. Their view is that the state ought to own and control the basic means of production and distribution, not for the sake of securing the good of society considered as a kind of collective organism, which might require sacrificing some individuals for the whole, but rather for the sake of securing the good of each individual member of society equally. Let's call this egalitarian socialism. This is a more familiar kind of socialism uh, these days, and it's the kind I'll be focusing on in my talk. So like contemporary liberals, egalitarian socialists would take a respect for the freedom and equality of all individuals to require that citizens of every race, ethnicity, and religious background should participate equally in the political process and enjoy the same level of economic well-being. That's what they claim to strive for anyway. Like contemporary liberals, they also take a respect for freedom and equality to entail liberation from traditional expectations where matters of sex and family are concerned. Hence, like contemporary liberals, egalitarian socialists are committed to the feminist program 
of ensuring that women participate in the public workplace and in holding the political offices, uh, the holding of political offices in more or less the same numbers as men. They are committed to the elimination of any discrimination or indeed any stigma against those with homosexual or transgender inclinations, and so forth. Contemporary liberals and egalitarian socialists both favor laws intended to promote this ideal of uh, equal political and economic outcomes for citizens of every race, ethnicity, religious background, sex, and sexual orientation. The difference between contemporary liberals and egalitarian socialists is that the socialist is inclined to, uh, to take much greater control over the economic system so as to ensure such outcomes. While the rhetoric of liberty and equality can be heard uh, coming from both uh, liberals and socialists alike, the accent for the liberal is on liberty, whereas the accent for the socialist is on equality. Hence, the liberal is willing in the name of liberty to support a basically free market or capitalist economy and to mitigate the inequalities that result by way of regulation and redistributive taxation. By contrast, the socialist is willing in the name of equality to give the state much greater control over the economy and to mitigate the loss of liberty that results by arguing that the freedom from discrimination and hardship that he seeks to secure is more important than the economic freedom that he takes away. Similarly, their accent on freedom makes most liberals reluctant to curb even political speech that they deem to be racist, sexist, or homophobic, whereas their accent on equality appears to make at least some egalitarian socialists more willing to consider curbing such speech, putting such restraints on free speech. As this last point indicates, there is bound to be a temptation, even for the democratic socialist, to increase control over the political sphere for the sake of securing control over the economic sphere, because the boundary between the two is not sharp. If you think that justice requires securing equal economic outcomes, even if this entails extensive curtailing of economic freedom, but find that freedom of speech keeps getting in the way, then it's hard to see why that should not be curtailed as well in the name of a purportedly more important kind of freedom, namely freedom from discrimination and the like. In light of all of these considerations, then, we can characterize socialism of the sort with which I'm concerned in this talk as centralized government control in practice, even if not on paper, over the basic means of production and distribution of goods, at least to a considerable extent, for the end of securing equal outcomes for individual citizens of every race, ethnicity, religious background, sex, and sexual orientation. Okay, so that's socialism as I'm characterizing it, egalitarian socialism in particular, and that's Roman numeral one on the handout. So moving to Roman numeral two, uh, let's now turn to the family. What is it? The late social scientist James Q. Wilson provided a useful first approximation when he characterized the family as, quote, a lasting socially enforced obligation between a man and a woman that authorizes sexual congress and the supervision of children, unquote. He meant this as descriptive rather than prescriptive, a characterization of what has in fact been the usual basic arrangement underlying the diverse uh, specific concrete forms that the family has taken in different cultures and different periods of history. And that quote's taken from his book, The Marriage Problem, for those who are, who are interested. <clears throat> the basic idea is that a family typically involves a man and a woman who have an ongoing sexual relationship that results in children, and where the relationship is perceived to be governed by social norms that require provision for the children, and at least some expectation that the, this relationship will continue. Uh, that's putting it somewhat vaguely, and it's doing so on purpose, because the way that works out concretely often varies from culture to culture, and period of history to period of history. In some cultures, this relationship requires a formal marriage or agreement. In others, the arrangement is looser. In some, there is an expectation of monogamy, while in others, polygamy is allowed. In some, divorce is permitted, and in others, it is not. In some, but not in others, marriages are arranged by parents, <clears throat> and so on. <clears throat> but the fundamental pattern persists despite variations in these secondary features. As Wilson points out, the family so understood is more basic than marriage. Historically, the institution of marriage arose as a safeguard to the family and is varied in the ways that it has, largely because of different judgments in different cultural circumstances about what was necessary to safeguard the family. Of course, there are also sometimes families that do not fit even Wilson's bare bones description. For example, an unmarried and celibate single woman who adopts foster children. But these cases are parasitic on the kind that Wilson describes. The children in such cases come into being in the first place 
only because of at least a brief sexual relationship between their biological parents. And the woman in my example takes on the role, uh, a role that is modeled on that of a biological mother. Indeed, as Wilson points out, the basic pattern he describes is as universal as it is precisely because it is grounded in basic human biology. Now, I'll come back to the biology in a moment, but first it will be useful to consider the normative or prescriptive implications that have traditionally been thought to follow from the nature of the basic institution that Wilson describes. For ease of exposition, I will sometimes put things in language of the sort that a natural law theorist in the tradition of Thomas Aquinas would use, but the broad outlines of, my, of the understanding of the morality of sex, marriage, and family that I'll be describing are by no means peculiar to that tradition. They're pretty much what people of all religions and cultures of the past have thought. These traditional moral views have also, needless to say, become very controversial in modern Western society, precisely because they conflict with the conception of individual freedom and equality that, I've said, a contemporary liberals and egalitarian socialists alike have in common. I'll come back to that controversy, too. But for the moment, let me just set out the traditional view. So since as a matter of biological fact, sex exists for the sake of procreation, and since in general there is a significant chance that any given act of sexual intercourse will result in pregnancy, systems of sexual morality <clears throat> have traditionally tended to hold <clears throat> excuse me, that there should be some sort of stigma against sex outside of the context of marriage and family. For children require that context in order to flourish, and since sex exists precisely for the purpose of bringing them into being, it would be indecent or even perverse to indulge in it in a way that might leave the resulting children outside that safe environment. That's the general attitude you find in different cultures uh, over time. Sexual activity uh, that tends to break the connection between sex and family, fornication, promiscuity, adultery, homosexuality, and so on, has thus traditionally been regarded as destabilizing to the institution and disapproved of for that reason. To use standard, uh, standard natural law jargon, Sex has a primarily procreative function, and its other legitimate function is the unitive function of bonding father and mother to each other, and thereby to the family that they have created. Now, since their sexual activity has a natural tendency to result in children, men and women are taken by traditional sexual morality to have a natural obligation to those children and to the family that the mother, father, and children comprise by virtue engaging in that sexual activity. That is to say, if you're going to do something that could make you into a father or a mother, then it's simply part of the deal that you're going to have to behave like a father or mother with all of that entails. But of course, we are naturally very strongly inclined to engage in this sexual activity. Hence, we are naturally made to be fathers and mothers and thus to form families. This is part of how we fulfill our nature, just as birds fulfill their nature by building nests and feeding their young. This is the fundamental way in which we are social animals, as Aristotle put it. We are made for one another, man for woman, woman for man, and man and woman together for their children. The family, then, is a natural institution, a kind of organic unit. Even in traditional societies where divorce is allowed, it is more like the amputation of a body part than it is like the dissolution of a business contract, something unnatural and to be avoided if at all possible. OK, so that's the traditional attitude you see in different systems of morality different religions. Like other organic wholes, each part of the family has, on this traditional view that I'm describing, its own distinctive role, which contributes to the proper, proper functioning of the whole. Pregnancy, childbirth, nursing, and basic childcare are so time consuming, especially when, as was true for most of human history, a woman has many children, that mothers tended historically to focus on the domestic sphere. Their greater physical strength and freedom from the rigors of pregnancy and childbirth, together with the need for an income for what was often a large family, meant that fathers tended historically to focus on providing for the family. When you factor in the idea that women uh, tend to be more nurturing and empathetic and men more competitive and analytical, the model of mother as homemaker and father as breadwinner is, from the traditional moral perspective that I'm describing, in several respects a natural rather than artificial arrangement. How it works out in practice may be more complicated than this brief description implies. But for the traditional moralist, that the basic pattern has persisted for so long in such a wide variety of cultures shows that it reflects something deep about human nature. Now, it's important to emphasize that the roles of father and mother are traditionally understood to be complementary rather than in competition. It's not a matter of men pursuing their own interests and women serving them. 
Rather, the father's labor and income belong to the family and not to himself alone. Again, the family on this traditional view I'm describing is seen as an organic unit with each member uh, doing its part for the family unit rather than for himself or herself. The idea is that, either mo uh, is that either mothers or fathers, the idea that either mothers or fathers are self-interested individuals bound to others only by voluntary, voluntary contractual obligations is a modern liberal individualist idea, not one that would be understood by most cultures historically or accepted by traditional moralists. I'll come back to that. Now, providing for a family and making a home require material resources. Natural law thinkers take this to be the foundation of the natural right to private property. For ought implies can. If I have a duty to provide materially for the family that I help build, uh, bring into being, then I must have the right to acquire the needed material resources. Since there's no set number of children the family may have and no foreseeing all the needs that it may have, and since once the children have families of their own, those families will in turn require material assistance, I must also have the right to amass these resources and to pass them on as an inheritance. Parents are also the ones most suited to provide for the material needs of their children since they have direct knowledge of what specifically those needs are. And they have an innate inclination to worry for their own children's well-being that strangers don't have. Unlike the offspring of non-human animals, Human children also need to be provided for spiritually as well as materially. Natural law thinkers take this to be the foundation of the natural right to educate one's own children. When I bring children into existence, I take on the obligation to give them the knowledge and moral instruction they need, no less than they need food, clothing, and shelter. If I have a duty to provide this, then I must also have the right to provide it. Parents are also the ones most suited to providing for the educational needs of their children, whether they do so by uh, educating the children themselves or they choose, uh, choose teachers for them, since, again, they have the most intimate knowledge of the needs and abilities of their own children and the greatest incentive to see to it that these needs are met. Okay. Now, again, though for purposes of exposition, I've been using natural law theory concepts like procreative and unitive function, complementarity and natural rights, these really just amount to a codification of what has been regarded as common sense in most cultures um, and in most periods of history. Evolutionary psychology and social science confirm that whatever one thinks of them, the basic arrangements I've been describing reflect something deep in human nature. Even just looked at in evolutionary terms, the basic family structure is what one would expect. Hence, consider some basic uh, biological facts and their implications. This is just the sort of standard thing you read in, in evolutionary psychologists. A man is capable in principle of fathering a very large number of children and need not be physically tied down to any of them or to their mother once he begets them. But if he leaves them, it will be relatively much harder for him to be certain which children are his. A woman, by contrast, is capable of having a relatively much smaller number of children and is physically tied down by them for long periods of time, given the demands of pregnancy, nursing, and the like. But at the same time, she can be certain that the children that she nurtures are her own. Though a man is likely, given these biological factors, to have a relatively greater interest in the sexual act than women are, he nevertheless has an incentive to stay with a woman he has children with so that he can be sure that the children he provides for are his own. And to strengthen, to strengthen the incentive to stay, he will tend to favor a woman who is sexually attractive and fertile and thus likely to be younger than himself. A woman, meanwhile, will have an incentive to look uh, for a man capable of supporting her and her children and thus will tend to be attracted to men showing in, uh, indications of status and earning power. These biological imperatives will also entail a tendency in each sex toward jealousy, though in somewhat different ways. Um, both sexes will resent infidelity, but in men the accent will be on the fear that the mother of his children will be sexually unfaithful, since this might lead to him expending effort to support another man's offspring. In women, the accent will be on the fear that the father of her children will fall in love with another woman since this might lead him to abandoning her and her children. Now, what I'm describing, of course, <clears throat> is, again, the standard explanation given by evolutionary psychologists of the differences between the sexes that common sense has always recognized and that many social scientists tend to reaffirm. That men are more likely to be drawn to pornography, for example, and to frequent uh, prostitutes, and women more likely to be drawn to romance novels, is taken to reflect the biologically grounded tendencies of men to focus more on the sexual act and women to focus more on commitment. 
In every culture, women tend to be more concerned with child rearing and intimate personal relationships than men are and appear to excel at reading body language and facial expressions and verbal nuance. In every culture, uh, men tend to be more aggressive and violently competitive and prone to risky behavior than women are and appear to excel at spatial visualization and spatial reasoning and to have a greater interest in things rather than in persons. These differences are thought by biologists to reflect the traits that natural selection would have favored in, respectively, nurturers on the one hand and the hunters that provide for them on the other. Even in modern Western countries deeply influenced by feminism, women tend to retain custody of the children when a couple splits and are more likely than men to sacrifice career goals for the sake of the family, and men tend to dominate business and public affairs. This is taken by evolutionary psychologists to reflect women's greater physical investment in child rearing and men's greater aggressiveness and need to attract women by attaining wealth and status. Social scientists point out the, that the institution of marriage, the broad outlines of which have until very recently reflected these biological factors, has benefits for all concerned. It affords women a provider for themselves and their children. It civilizes men, channeling male competitiveness in a constructive direction and moderating the male tendency toward risky behavior. It gives children stability and boys especially the discipline and role modeling without which they tend to fall into destructive behaviors. <clears throat> now it is true that these are stereotypes, but the biological and social scientific evidence indicates that the reason they are stereotypes is that they are true. Of course, the way all this works out in practice is more complicated than this brief summary lets on. And of course, the idea that something was favored by natural selection does not by itself entail that we should favor it ourselves. Nor, it must be emphasized, does the idea that sex differences are grounded in biology have anything at all to do with uh, arguing for male superiority. Different doesn't mean better or worse. It just means different. The point is just that modern biology tends to confirm the judgment of common sense and natural law moralists alike that complementarity between the sexes and the basic family structure are grounded in human nature and not a mere contingent social construct. This is acknowledged by liberals like Steven Pinker and Robert Wright, who urge their fellow egalitarians to frame their efforts at reform in a biologically realistic way. If people are left to themselves, patterns that reflect the basic family structure and the traditional sexual division of labor are bound to appear spontaneously, at least in a very rough and general way. Cultural and political developments can weaken and distort the patterns, as the rise of individualism and fem feminism have in the West, but they will not entirely destroy them. As Horace famously said, you can drive out nature with a pitchfork, but you'll keep coming back. Okay, so that's section two. <clears throat> now we come to the third section, Roman numeral three there on the handout. Um, this brings us at last to the conflict between socialism and the family. As I've said, egalitarian socialism shares with liberalism a commitment to equal economic outcomes and political power for all, regardless of sex, and to equal freedom uh, of all from discrimination or stigma, regardless of sexual orientation. The difference, <clears throat> excuse me, the difference is that the socialist favors even more radical state intervention in the economy in order to secure these ends. The threat this poses to the family might be obvious from what has been said already, but is worth spelling out explicitly. It is important to emphasize at the outset, however, that the fundamental move that has exposed the family to danger from socialism was made by the liberal individualist tradition rather than by socialism itself. The socialist is merely walking through the door that the liberal individualist opened. <clears throat> the fundamental move in question was liberalism's replacement of the classical Aristotelian conception of the human being as by nature a social animal with the liberal idea of the human being as a sovereign individual. Again, for ancient and medieval thinkers, man is by nature made for woman and woman for man, and their union is by nature meant to result in a new family unit. The familial context is our natural state. The obligations that follow upon it are binding on us by virtue of our nature rather than by virtue of any social contract that we agree to. And our fundamental natural rights are the rights to do what we need to do <clears throat> in order to fulfill our obligations as fathers, mothers, and children. The family is the fundamental unit of society, and the way we are social animals is primarily by virtue of being familial animals. Individuals are incomplete without the family. And larger social organizations, such as the state, exist primarily for the sake of assisting and safeguarding the family. That's the traditional picture. 
Now, liberalism replaced this conception with the idea of the individual as the fundamental social unit, related to other human beings only by contract rather than by natural obligation. If I consent to taking on certain obligations to others, then I have those obligations. But if I do not consent, then I have no obligations. On this view, the individual is not by nature made for family or for any other particular end. We simply have whatever individual ends or desires we happen to have, and none of them is intrinsically better or worse than any others. They can be objected to only insofar as they might lead an individual to try to frustrate the desires of other individuals. The state, on this view, exists for the sake of enabling all individuals to pursue their desires, whatever they happen to be, as far as this is consistent with other individuals pursuing whatever desires they happen to have. Whatever political or social barriers tend to frustrate individuals in the fulfillment of their desires, especially if these desires are compatible with others, uh, individuals fulfilling their desires, comes to be seen as oppressive and unjust. Justice on this view comes to be seen as a matter of liberating people from such barriers. Now, the history of liberalism from Hobbes and Locke to the present, and of Western politics in general in modern times, is essentially a history of the working out of the implications of this basic idea. It's a history of ever more expansive conceptions of equality and ever more radical demands for liberation. John Stuart Mill's celebration of diverse individual, quote, experiments in living, that's his famous phrase, and his call for the dismantling of the barriers to such experimentation that are posed not only by law, but also by public opinion and custom, is the classic philosophical expression of the idea. This is in his famous book on liberty. Mill was also clear about the implications of this idea for marriage and family. He argued that we should be skeptical about claims that men and women have by nature different and complementary roles and psychological traits on the grounds that observed differences may reflect merely male oppression of women rather than nature. Even women who seem naturally to prefer traditional arrangements may have merely internalized conventional opinion rather than behaving as they would have in its absence, in Mill's view. Mill advocated reconceiving marriage as a contract between self-interested individuals for the sake of their personal fulfillment, rather than an indissoluble organic union for the sake of children and family. This, in turn, required that men and women be more or less financially independent of one another, both before and after marriage, and a relaxation of legal barriers and social stigma against divorce. And the family that results from marriage ought, in Mill's view, to become what he called a, quote, school of sympathy and equality, and a school of the virtues of freedom, unquote. That is to say, for Mill, the family ought to be a context in which children imbibe the liberal ideal of freedom for and equality between diverse experiments in living, an ideal that children will learn by seeing it lived by their parents. Now, it goes without saying that Millian liberalism has, since the 1960s, essentially become the governing doctrine of modern American society. Feminism and the sexual revolution and all that they have led to, uh, such as the massive influx of uh, mothers into the workforce, widespread divorce and remarriage, the routine use of contraception and legalized abortion, the disappearance of any stigma against sex outside of marriage and illegitimacy, uh, the gay rights movement, the same-sex uh, marriage movement, transgender rights movement, and so forth, and so forth are all consequences of applying Mill's principle of freedom for diverse experiments in living to matters of sex, marriage, and the family. Now, to be sure, Mill himself would not necessarily have approved of, much less foreseen, some of these developments, but they were bound to follow from the premises that he laid down. Now, there's nothing distinctively socialist about those developments considered by themselves. Nevertheless, there are several ways in which liberalism's undermining of traditional moral views concerning sex, marriage, and the family have tended to lead Western society in an increasingly socialist direction. The first is that liberalism has come to regard the basic premises of feminism and of the sexual revolution as matters of justice. It is, on this view, unjust if men and women are not equally represented in the workforce outside the home and in various career fields. It's unjust if some women cannot afford to pay for contraception or abortions. It's unjust or if a business or other private organization does not want to participate in a same-sex wedding or to hire someone who is transgender, and so on. Hence, since government is supposed to ensure that justice is done, the logical outcome of these liberal premises is that government will have to intervene in the private economy so as to ensure as far as possible that equal numbers of men and women are represented in different fields, 
that traditional views about sexual morality do not influence the way businesses and other private organizations make hiring decisions and conduct their affairs, that health plans cover abortion and contraception, and so forth. In short, to secure the goals of feminism and the sexual revolution, the state will have to claim for itself greater rights to decide how private organizations can operate. Since ownership of an enterprise involves, as I've said, the possession of a bundle of rights concerning how it is to operate, the state's taking upon itself the right to make these decisions amounts to its having partial ownership of private enterprises, a partial socializing of them, as it were. The second way that the breakdown of the traditional morality of sex, marriage, and family has a tendency to give way to socialism is that the more the traditional family structure breaks down, the more individuals there are, especially single mothers and children, who find themselves without sufficient private means of support and who thus require greater governmental assistance. This plausibly accounts for what social scientists have called the marriage gap in US voting patterns. Both married men and married women are likelier to vote for conservative candidates. By contrast, unmarried men are significantly more likely to vote for liberal candidates, and unmarried women are massively more likely to vote for liberal candidates. If you're a breadwinner capable of supporting a family or the spouse of such a breadwinner, you are less likely to need state assistance and are bound to resent the government taxing away income that could be used for the benefit of your family. By contrast, if you do not have a family to support you, uh, you will be less resentful of taxation. Um, and if you're a single mother with children or a woman unable to find a husband, you are bound to regard government as a kind of surrogate provider. Now, these are material factors that lead in the direction of socialism. But a third point is that there are spiritual or moral factors that do so as well. Human beings are by nature social animals, and they remain so even when liberal individualism prevents their social nature from being realized the ways, in the ways that it traditionally did. People long to be part of something bigger than themselves, and when the family is not there to fulfill this need, they will look for a substitute. This can make the idea of a socialist society attractive, especially to young people who, in a culture of widespread divorce and remarriage, illegitimacy and single parenthood, with a revolving door of stepfathers, all of this often entails, have never known stable family life. At the same time, the sexual revolution has made people creatures of appetite, impatient with self-discipline, and demanding of benefits without cost to themselves. If the decay of the traditional family has a tendency to lead society in a socialist direction, socialism also has a tendency to undermine the traditional family. In other words, the causality goes in both directions. So consider first the purely economic side of socialist policy. Socialists often advocate a universal basic income, single-payer health care, state funding of education for all, even through the college level, and heavy inheritance taxes. All basic material needs will thereby be provided by the state rather than by the father or even the father and mother together. The breadwinner, the breadwinner role, in other words, is dispensed with, which undermines the incentive for fathers to provide for their children or mothers to look for a father to provide for them. The state becomes the de facto breadwinner for all. And the, the economic ties that strengthen the bond between father, mother, and children are destroyed. Obviously, dependence on the state would be even greater given a full-blown socialist nationalization of the means of production uh, or the abolition of private property. But it's important to emphasize that even a milder form of socialism that didn't go that far and merely confined itself to the redistributive measures just mentioned would essentially take over the role of material provider for all citizens. Parents would be reduced to the status of local administrators of the state's largesse. But it's not just the function of material provider that the socialist state usurps from parents. He who pays the piper calls the tune. If the state is paying the bills, then the state will decide what it is going to pay for, when, and how. Liberal activists already fret over whether parents make sound decisions about what their children eat, whether to vaccinate them, and so forth, and are willing to interfere with these health-related decisions by banning junk food in schools and legally requiring vaccinations. Liberals are also already willing to interfere with parental health-related decisions in far more significant ways, insofar as they have long opposed laws that require parental notification and consent when a minor seeks an abortion, and now often oppose laws requiring parental consent when a minor seeks transgender treatment such as hormone injections. A socialist state, which involves a more thoroughgoing penetration of government into the private sphere in general, and direct state control over the healthcare system in particular, will inevitably usurp parental decision-making with respect to healthcare in an even more radical way 
than, than uh, liberal governments already do. In a socialist state, this is bound to include mandatory sex education, presented as a kind of health education, and informed by the principles of feminism and the sexual revolution, and direct state provision to minors of contraception, abortion, and transgender treatments. In this way, the socialist state, even just in its role as sole, as sole health care provider, will have a massive influence on the molding of the character of children. Naturally, will have an even deeper influence in its role as sole provider of education. In a thoroughgoing socialist state, private schools and homeschooling would be abolished altogether, and all children would have to be educated in public schools. But even a socialist government that refrained from going this far could achieve much the same results by heavily regulating the content of private education. Needless to say, the principles of feminism and the sexual revolution would determine what children are taught and how they are taught it. Anything that smacked of what liberals and socialists would characterize as sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and the like would be forbidden. Mill's vision of a society committed to the fostering of diverse experiments in living would essentially become a kind of state religion, inculcated from preschool onward and informing all policy. The only experiments in living that would not be permitted would be those that involve a return to the traditional family structure or a traditional religious way of life. Teaching that sort of thing to one's children would be prohibited as a kind of child abuse. Now, this taking over of the function of molding the character of children will be facilitated by the circumstance that the socialist state is bound to usurp the traditional role of the mother no less than that of the father. Socialists like Marx's collaborator Friedrich Engels and feminist thinker Simone de Beauvoir argued that women's equality could not be achieved so long as some women continue to choose to devote themselves to homemaking and child rearing. In their estimation, this choice reflected a kind of false consciousness, the internalization of patriarchal ideology and ought not to be respected. To liberate women from this patriarchal oppression requires liberating them, liberating them from the home, and this in turn entails requiring them to enter the workforce. In line with this sort of thinking, feminist writer Sarah uh, Lemarquan argued in a controversial 2017 article that it ought to be illegal to be a stay-at-home mother. Lemarquan writes, quote, only when the tiresome and completely unfounded claim that, quote, feminism is about choice is dead and buried, it's not about choice, it's about equality, will we consign restrictive gender stereotypes to history, unquote. Now, few socialists are willing to say this sort of thing, at least publicly, but it is a completely natural conclusion to draw if one applies socialist means to feminist ends. And less extreme policies have the same goal. The aim of government-funded daycare is, of course, to facilitate getting mothers out of the home and back into the workforce. Into the bargain, it provides an even earlier educational context in which the socialist state can begin to mold the characters of children, something, uh, something mothers traditionally would have done by virtue of uh, being with their children throughout the day during the entirety of their earliest years. The point is to make men and women essentially the same, fellow workers in the public sphere, each pursuing his or her own individual careerist ends, with distinctive paternal and maternal roles disappearing, and spouses becoming roommates with benefits who administer the provision of state services to the children. Now, recall that to have ownership over something is to possess a bundle of rights over it. Parents don't exactly own their children, of course, but they do have stewardship over them. And stewardship is similar to ownership insofar as it involves the possession of a similar bundle of rights. Parental stewardship involves having rights like the right to make decisions related to providing for one's children, the right to make decisions about their education, the right to make health care related decisions for them, and so forth. But the socialist state, as I've argued, will at least to a large extent reserve such rights to itself. Furthermore, in the name of feminism and the sexual revolution, it will implement policies that attenuate the traditional paternal and maternal roles of men and women and encourage individualist careerism and sexual freedom over self-sacrifice for the family. In these ways, the socialist state will make of itself the father and mother of all and turn biological parents into something approximating nannies who implement the directives of this governmental parent. The aim is to turn human beings from social animals into socialist animals. The worry is not that such a program would succeed. If socialist economics is contrary to the natural order of things, and I would argue that it is, socialist family policy is even more so. It cannot possibly succeed. 
The trouble is that socialism, radical feminism, and sexual liberation are revolutionary ideologies. And revolutionary ideologues never admit that their revolutions have failed, no matter how overwhelming the evidence. So we've seen, you know, only a couple decades after the fall of the Soviet Union, you see it tried again in Venezuela and now promoted from the halls of Congress. Instead, they conclude that the revolution, the, the revolution hasn't gone far enough, and they double down, blaming the human suffering that inevitably results on those who resist the revolution. This happened in the Soviet Union, in communist China, in Cuba, in North Korea, and it's happening now in Venezuela. It has also happened in the wake of the sexual revolution. As social scientists like David Papineau and David Blankenhorn have shown, children in fatherless families are more likely to exhibit emotional and behavioral problems, health problems, and academic problems, to have greater difficulties in their own personal relationships and marriages, and to, make, and to commit crimes, suffer abuse, and live in poverty in greater numbers than than they otherwise would. Social scientists like Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers have noted that as the agenda of feminism and the sexual revolution has ever more thoroughly transformed Western society since the late 1960s, opinion polls have consistently noted a corresponding steady decline in female happiness, both in absolute terms and relative to men's reported happiness. Feminists have, de have denied that men and women inherently differ in terms of their uh, attitudes towards sex and the sexual revolution destroyed traditional norms regarding modesty and male chivalry. The consequence has been the explosion in aggressively lecherous behavior that triggered the Me Too movement. Yet defenders of the sexual revolution refuse to admit the obvious, that children need both a mother and a father, that the traditional norms of modesty and restraint protected women from loudish men, and that women are biologically hardwired to yearn for children and for a stable provider for them, and most will therefore be unhappy when careerism and promiscuity delay these things, or even leave them in middle age, childless, unmarried, and lonely. And then there is the horrific number of abortions that have been performed since the sexual revolution began in the tens of millions. When a woman, when a woman is biologically wired to nurture and protect a child, killing that child instead, and while it, at, while it is at its most vulnerable, is inevitably going to leave scars of guilt and emptiness that feminist ideological rationalization can only do so much to paper over. Now, the disastrous nature of the sexual revolution is a topic of its own, and I'm not going to address it any further here. The point for present purposes is that as American liberalism morphs into socialism, these bad consequences are going to increase. Defenders of the sexual revolution are going to be hardened further in the ideological thinking that prevents them from acknowledging the cause of the disaster and the whole delusional enterprise will be backed by the full power of the state. Naturally, political action is needed in order to counter these trends, but any political successes will be limited and temporary unless the root cause of the crisis of the family is addressed. That root cause, I would argue, is the cult of the sovereign individual, and unfortunately, too many conservatives halfway buy into this cult themselves. There is, especially in recent years, a temptation among some conservatives to trade in the rich family, culture, and religion-oriented conservative tradition from Edmund Burke to Roger Scruton for the thin gruel of libertarianism. This may have political advantages in some cases in the short term, but in the long term it is suicidal. The free market and the free society cannot survive without strong and independent families. What Margaret Thatcher said of the former is true of the latter as well. There is no alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faden. Uh, do we have a mic running around? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have time for questions, and uh, we have a microphone. And if you, when you ask your question, if you could state your name and any institutional affiliation, and please wait for the mic before you answer or ask a question. Questions. This gentleman here. Uh, Shane McCrum here with Heritage Foundation. Um, so you mentioned the disaster of Venezuela, um, but how would you reply to the like somewhat success of the Nordic system um, in Norway, in Sweden, and Finland? Um, people often claim that you know socialism, in that sense, has succeeded. How would you reply to that? Well, I, I mean, I would say that the reason it's, it's succeeded to the extent that it has, and people could quibble about the details. But the reason it, it, that it has, to the extent that it has, is that it's not really a, a fully socialist system, or really anything close to that. It's essentially a capitalist system with socialist elements piggybacking on it. As I mentioned in the, in the beginning of the talk, the term socialism is often used fairly loosely, so that any governmental inter intervention 
is described as socialist. And then it's either condemned on that basis by people who oppose socialism, or it's approved of, and then people think, well, maybe socialism's not so bad, right? Because they think that these particular policies aren't so bad. Um, and I think that's what's going on when people think of uh, Nordic countries as being socialist. But they really have essentially you know, capitalist economies. I mean, IKEA, for example, is not a government, uh, governmental enterprise, right? It's a private <coughs> enterprise, just to take one familiar example. So I would say that's the reason. They're not really socialist systems. They're essentially capitalist systems, and the wealth generated by the capitalist system is being used for socialist ends, but not, in, but not by way of strictly socialist means. Let, let me just add a little bit, since now we're a little more into my area than, than Ed. Uh, those countries are socialist in only one respect. They have high levels of individual taxation. They tax the middle class heavily. They, uh, until this year, they ranked higher than the United States on the uh, Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom. Now they're slightly behind the United States. Uh, but that's also true in other measures of economic freedom, like the Fraser Institutes, World Banks, and, and, and others. Uh, so unless the United States has been socialist for a very long time, these countries are not socialist. They have a lower corporate tax rate than the United States even today post-tax reform. Uh, and prior to the, the recent tax reform legislation, they were dramatically lower than the United States. They have, uh, in many respects, uh, freer labor markets. Uh, they have freer trade. Uh, th so they're not socialist countries. However, they went through a phase where they were becoming quasi-socialist in the seven, late 70s through the 90s. And their economic performance began to fail. And they, they realized they were making a serious policy mistake and reversed those policies and became quite free except for high levels of taxation on individuals. Other questions? This gentleman back here. Um, yeah, Gabriel Greenspan from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, so you mentioned how John Stuart Mill, um, how his <laughs> thinking, at least in your view, um, you know, will at some point to some extent already has led to either the elimination or the regulation of private schools and homeschooling. Um, now, I personally, you know, am, am not at all ideologically symp sympathetic with John Stuart Mill. I think he did a tremendous amount of harm ideologically. But if you read him, he he was quite clear that um, he supported broad freedoms for private school and homeschooling and educational alternatives. Um, he would have viewed it as, you know, all of these things as as more experiments of living, as he would have put it. And so do you think John Stuart Mill's thinking inevitably leads to regulation and elimination of those types of things and Mill was simply being uh, logically inconsistent? Or do you think that it, it could lead in a different direction and it simply happened to lead in that direction based on the way history worked out? Right. So... What I said about Mill was not, I didn't say that Mill's uh, idea of experiments, experiments in living led to uh, things like government schooling. I say what it led to was the sexual revolution. And then the sexual revolution, in turn, I did say, uh, was among the factors that I think have led to increased governmental intervention. But I, I didn't mean to imply that, that uh, Mill himself or that a follower of Mill would necessarily have to endorse uh, governmental interventions, even of a, of a more moderate liberal kind or a more radical socialist kind. You have, you know, obviously you have libertarians who are, who are big fans of John Stuart Mill's experiments in living principle, but who also would be, you know, as hostile to socialism as I am. So I, I didn't mean to imply there was some necessary link, uh, a conceptual link, a philosophical link. There isn't. The link, I think, is more um, indirect and it's more an empirical link or sociological link. That is to say, when you, uh, when you favor a general worldview that tends to dissolve the, the, the stability of the traditional family, there's going to be enough social breakdown where there's going to be a need for and call for greater governmental intervention, even if one does not favor that, even if one tries to hold philosophically to Mill's principle of, of uh, experiments in living and to a, you know, a, a radically anti-socialist uh, economics. Are there any questions over here? Because I can't. That's really... This gentleman here. Uh, hi, my name's Nick Wood. Um, so you were talking about how the breakdown of the traditional family kind of naturally leads to socialism. Um, do you think it would be possible for there to be a, a civilization uh, which is which has these traditional family values and just all of a sudden switches to socialism? Would the traditional family values be stable in such an environment, or would it would the traditional family values naturally break down in a socialist environment? 
I think they would naturally break down in, 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 a, in a socialist environment. But I also think that strong, stable families of a traditional sort would, would prevent socialism. I mean, it would be very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that strong, stable, traditional families are very jealous of their independence. Uh, parents don't want the state interfering with how their children are raised, and they don't want the state taking their money from them. Right? It's only when you have society sort of atomized into, into individuals who often find themselves in situations where they're, they're helpless unless they have governmental support that I think socialism becomes attractive to a, to, you know, to a mass of people. Short of that, I think people, when you, when you, you know, if you think of the traditional family structure, it wasn't just the nuclear family. It was also the extended family. So you go back 100 years ago, or even just you know, the time of my grandparents' generation, people typically had five, six, seven kids. And those kids went on to have families of their own. If something happens to you, you know, even if your own parents couldn't help you out, which they probably could, but even if they couldn't, there's always your uncle or your aunt or whatever. And if not them, then some other uncle or whatever, some other family, your cousins. There, there's always someone there to help you out. There's, there, there are informal, private um, uh, uh, avenues of recourse before you even have to start thinking about governmental assistance. Yeah. It's when that breaks down that people start to think, well, if I don't have you know, help from my immediate family, I may only have one or two uh, siblings, right? And if they can't, uh, they can't help me out, I have no one else to turn to but the state. That's when socialism becomes attractive to people on a mass level. Question for this gentleman here, and then behind. Um, hello, doctor. My name is Sam. I'm an intern here in domestic policy. Um, my question was, after you mentioned that you've, the, root, the root cause of the problem seems to be this cult of individualism, which isn't specific to socialism, it's actually a a brainchild of liberalism. And you know, we could go on um, and liberals could defeat socialists in the near future here in America and in other countries in the West, but we would still probably have this problem reoccurring if we don't re rehabilitate the core values that lead to strong families. Um, so my question is, as you have increasing secularization in the West, in Europe, America, other places, um, how, how would you ever rehabilitate those values, even if liberalism continues to triumph over socialists? Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're having, like, the United States, you know, like, a vast minority of people retaining their Christian identity, the same in Europe, how would those values ever become prominent again? And you have, like, a lasting solution to this problem, um, assuming, like, you know, no one, the you know, Christians don't just convert everyone <laughs> in the near future. So. Well, I, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It's a big question. Um, I'm inclined to say that in the long run, you're not going to have uh, a, a really solid and civilization-wide rehabilitation of the family until you have something similar happen in the religious sphere. And so I think what that, I mean, part of what that requires is a, a, a defense of religion, especially by religious people themselves. And I think that, you know, I mentioned at the end of my talk that um, I think too many conservatives are, you know, they get timid about defending the traditional family, and they say, let's just focus on economic policy, and they move to kind of a functional libertarianism. But I think you see something similar to that in, in the context of religion. You find um, Christians and Jews and other religious people who often, they, when it comes to co uh, commenting on public affairs, they'll confine themselves to, uh, to issues and premises that they have in common with a larger secular world and are almost embarrassed about or ashamed to defend the distinctively religious uh, view of the world. And I think that has to change. I mean, that's suicidal uh, as well. But that's, that's something, just as, the, as I suggested with defense of the family is, that ultimately is not going to be solved by any particular governmental policy. It's something that I think has to, has to uh, occur at the grassroots. I don't want to say that governmental policy is irrelevant to these things. But at the end of the day, what's really going to have to change is, is what's going on at the, grass, at the grassroots level. It's going to have to be a, a culture-wide phenomenon and not just uh, one that, at the level of policy. This gentleman here. Hey, uh, Parker Gardner with the National Taxpayers Union. So you used uh, Venezuela as an example of failed uh, socialistic economic policy. Is there evidence in Venezuela of the failed social aspect of socialism as far as the breakdown of the traditional family and decline in moral values? Well, that's an interesting question. David, maybe you could comment on that. My, my own understanding of it is that 
you have in Venezuela, and you, this, this often seems to be true um, outside uh, the context of Western Europe and the United States, that you, you don't have socialism there combined so much with a radical kind of sexual revolution agenda. That's, that's more of a, of a Western thing. Now, what happens over time, that's another, that's another story. Um, and you know, you, you, I think you definitely had a breakdown of the traditional family in the, in the long haul in the, in the Eastern Bloc countries and in uh, socialist countries in general. But in the short term, you might not have that. And I don't, I don't, I don't know that, that, that I, I think there's actually not much of a correlation at the, at the level of ideology um, in uh, you know, those who are running the show down in uh, Venezuela. Uh, but that's as, that's as much as I, as I know to comment on. Uh, I don't think I have a lot to add. I mean, you have total economic meltdowns, shortages, people, uh, ma massive population weight loss because people are starving, uh, eating zoo animals, multi m millions of people emigrating because they're, they're starving. Uh, and, and that's all caused by socialism, but as to the, the actual impact on the family, I, I don't know if I have a lot to They'll probably start marketing it that way, you know. Socialism is a great, it's a great diet plan. It works, yeah. you know. You don't, you don't want to be a zoo animal in Venezuela <laughs> right now. This gentleman back here. I'm always amazed by the passion that some have for socialism in spite of obvious evidence that would, that would say it's failed worldwide. You mentioned sort of the setup they use, you know, if it fails, well, it's only because we didn't go far enough. We weren't revolutionary enough in our ideals. What else do you think contributes to this passion for it in spite of what seems to be overwhelming evidence, as David was just pointing out? Is it what's happening in academia? Is it just the passion for something new? Where does that come from? That's, that's one question I'd like you to comment on. One other, you mentioned the, the defense of our values and that we tend to be not the type that will engage that fight. And that's, I seem to see that, and I think it's true. However, the other side is, they're wild about it. They defend at all costs. There's no limits. We're kind of the British redcoats, you know, marching <laughs> with dignity, but we're too dignified to stoop to that battle. What needs to take place, similar to the other question you asked, to wake people up to the idea that we need to engage this fight in a more... Um, passionate and aggressive way? And I know that's a broad question too, but the best you can. Yeah. Well, so let me try to say something about, about all of those, uh, those uh, issues you raised. Um, as far as the appeal of it, as I indicated in the talk, I think part of it, I'm not saying the whole of it, I mean, part of it is just anything that's radical and revolutionary and implies the overthrow of traditional institutions, young people are going to be suckers for that, you know. And it's, so it's no surprise that the, loud, the loudest mouths these days are people who are 14 years old and somehow got elected to Congress. I mean, not, not that I have anyone in particular in mind. Um, but, uh, so that's part of it. Another part of it, though, as I indicated in the talk, is that I think that as traditional institutions break down and, and, and the family and the church and you know, religion in general and, and all these other intermediate institutions, as Edmund Burke might have called them, no longer have the, um, the hold over people uh, that they used to have, that people look for something else, some bigger cause to belong to. And I think that's part of the appeal of socialism and part of the reason for the, for the passion of it. Another part of the reason for the passion of it, though, I think is precisely that it doesn't work, right? Now, what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, when you're emotionally committed to something and it doesn't work, it's very difficult to maintain the same level of attachment to it unless you double down on the emotional fuel. It's very tempting to think it didn't work because the bad guys wouldn't let it work, right? So you kind of whip yourself up and others into this fervor of, of, of moral... Uh, indignation and moral condemnation on the other side. You, you're just sort of digging the hole deeper. The emotional investment becomes deeper and deeper, starts feeding on itself. And the, uh, the emotional appeal of the idea starts substituting for the evidence in its favor, which is lacking, right? The emotional fuel starts doing, uh, doing more work. Now, this brings me to the, to the last issue you raised, w w that you raised, which is the way that uh, conservatives and, and others opposed to socialism, uh, how they ought to resist this. And part of my answer to that uh, is that I think they ought to stop um, presuming the good intentions on, on the other side. I mean, a lot of the people who promote socialism are not basically, you know, just good old folks who are confused. If they were, they wouldn't be so nasty uh, and so impervious to evidence and rational argumentation, so prone to ad hominem attacks. So I think there's a tendency of conservatives often to presuppose the best of their 
of their uh, opponents. And sometimes that's true. I mean, there's some, there's some good people on the other side who are just confused, just wrong. But there are a lot of people who are not. And I think that they need to be responded to more aggressively, certainly in a rational way. I'm not talking about the kind of thuggish tactics that have, that have become more and more popular on the left, but in a, in a vigorous and self-confident way, uh, it, as well as in, in a way that has superior intellectual firepower. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. And as I said, the next event will be March 5th, Paul Winfrey, uh, Freedom and Solidarity. You have to have both. Thanks again.